In the mid-2010s, Timex had a dilemma. They'd been making watches for over a century, and it had been going quite well. They'd ridden out the quartz crisis and numerous worldwide recessions. But by 2007, a far more dangerous threat had emerged. And we are calling it iPhone. Despite seeming unrelated on the surface, Steve Jobs' famous iPhone announcement was akin to a death knell for not just Timex, but the whole low-cost watch industry. The average Joe now had an internet-connected, time-telling device at his fingertips that beat even a quartz watch in terms of accuracy and with a huge range of additional capabilities to boot. A short while later, modern smartwatches then took this a step further, signifying the clear intent of tech giants to take over that space on your wrist. This left regular watch brands like Timex at a crossroads. At this point, they were still widely seen as a brand for durable, cheap timepieces. The type that lasts well, but you wouldn't exactly want to show off to your mates. The same type that was now outflanked on multiple fronts, including by upcoming Chinese watch brands who could offer higher specs for less money. How would Timex adapt to this changing landscape? Would they cut costs? make their own smartwatch, lean more on their fashion brand clients, or maybe change industries completely. Well, surprisingly, it seems they did none of these. While they still produce many budget pieces in 2024, most of Timex's new releases command massively higher prices. And given how quickly some of these sell out, it seems people are willing to stump up the cash to get one. How exactly did they manage this? How has Timex transitioned from bargain bucket tickers to multi-hundred dollar timepieces in just a few short years? Well, I've blown 460 pounds or just shy of $600 on two of their newest pieces to find out. These are the Degradé reissue and the recently released Marlin Jet Automatic. Surprisingly, even these aren't the most expensive Timex watches you can buy. That honor goes to the beautiful Galley range, which I reviewed a couple of years back. Nevertheless, I think this pair perfectly illustrates Timex's new approach to watchmaking. Let's delve in. First up is the Degradé reissue. This is the latest in a string of reissue models we've seen since the Marlin was relaunched back in 2017. Given its extensive history, Tamex has a vast back catalogue of watch designs to fall back on, allowing them to cherry pick proven winning designs to reimagine and then reintroduce. The most popular of these was the dive style Q Timex, though the Degradé is far more experimental than its forebearer. This 70s themed piece features an extreme wavy design with three distinct ridges and a stark gradation from the champagne like colour in the centre to a black outer rim, hence the Degradé name. Unlike previous reissue watches, I struggled to find any pictures of the original version of this watch online, though as a commenter on my unboxing channel pointed out, it does look rather similar to this 70s Citizen Cosmotron. The dial catches the light in a very striking manner, though the expressionism does come at the cost of legibility, as the logo and hands do have a habit of blending in at certain angles. Still, this one is no doubt a conversation starter. In some ways, partly down to the colour scheme, it also exudes some Art Deco vibes, and perhaps that's partly down to the curious three-dimensional crystal covering the dial. While this acrylic is raised like many others, you'll quickly notice that it cleverly houses a unique faceted shape on the underside, giving the illusion of the crystal comprising of nine flat segments, akin to a photographer's rule of thirds grid. Now the exterior isn't actually angular. It's smooth like standard domed glass, so you can still buff the crystal with polywatch to remove scratches. I have to say it looks rather unusual, and if anything, it complements the dial arrangement, as the ridges in the crystal satisfyingly align perfectly with those sitting beneath. When I first saw this feature in their marketing material, I thought it could look like one of those oversized toy princess rings or jewels, you know, super tacky and cheap. But in person, the whole package looks surprisingly subtle, and dare I say, good looking? Perhaps it's the case shape or bracelet, I'm unsure, but on the wrist, I think this one looks much better than in the stock images and marketing. It's £180 right now, so it's not cheap. But at a glance, you'd think it was still more expensive than that, given the glamorous surface and 3D trickery. Size-wise, the Degradé is fairly compact, with a mere 38mm diameter, 45mm lug-to-lug, and 12mm thickness, including that experimental crystal. Like most Timex watches, this one is powered by quartz movement, which is my main point of frustration with this watch. 
No, not the fact it's quartz, I quite like quartz, it's purely the loudness of the tick. The PC33A caliber within isn't far off the infamous Timex Weekender in terms of volume, despite being manufactured by TMI, a subsidiary of the Seiko Group. Yeah, Timex using a Seiko movement sounds counterintuitive, right? I don't remember coming across a TMI marked movement before, making this a subpar first impression. Hey, it is aligned relatively well and the hand movement isn't super bouncy or inconsistent like some other watches, but you'll want this piece nowhere near your bedside cabinet unless insomnia is your idea of a fun time. You at least get a quick access battery hatch on the rear of the watch, and unlike some similarly arranged Swatch watches, it maintains a reasonable 5 bar water resistance rating, which is good enough for day to day usage and short term submergence. As a whole, the case finishing here is reasonable with prominent radial brushing on the upper and plain polished sides combining to form a retro circular design. It's not the most precisely cut case out there, but it does have curved hooded 20mm lugs that give it a particularly smooth look when on the wrist. I've always preferred 60s designs instead of 70s, but this one, it really is reaching out to me. The included Jubilee style bracelet suits the look perfectly, and it's built better than I expected given how rubbish most other big brand straps are at this price. The other Q models, for instance, were awful in this regard and ripped hairs off your arm like a lawnmower. Instead, this unit has solid links and even quick release tabs, with the only major flaw being that one side sits a little too snug and might need lubricating to move freely. It also lacks micro adjustment holes, though the small link size of Jubilees makes this a bit less of an issue than usual. That said, a three step class would have still been better from a fit perspective. Despite this, it rarely pulls hairs on my arm and adds to the overall mass of the product for a better first impression. In my experience, the Degrade wears far better than the previous Q models with those squared off lugs, such as the Falcon Eye for example, despite seeming like a less appealing watch on the surface. The Degrade is compact, comfortable and truly unlike anything else I've reviewed despite its cons. Similar can be said of the Marlin Jet Automatic, which I'll also link in the video description. Now we'll get the main con out of the way first. Despite costing around £100 more than the Degrade, it ships with a worse stock strap. This NATO style band suits the look excellently, but is subpar in terms of quality, and it already looks quite rough after just a handful of wears. Compounding the pain is the awkward 19mm lug size. Most third party watch straps are made in even sizes like 18 or 20mm, so finding a 19mm band that suits your tastes may cause some unexpected headaches. It is very comfortable as it uses a holeless design that can be pronged through at any point, though the long term durability remains highly questionable. On paper, the acrylic crystal also seems like a major point of concern. Most watches at this price ship with a much more scratch resistant sapphire crystal, which costs much more money to produce, so the intent is obvious, right? Well, acrylic may surprisingly have been the optimal choice for this one. It's a material known for exhibiting a vintage style warping at the edges, which is certainly on display here, and it also suits the retro futuristic vibe of the watch. However, it's the impact resistance of acrylic versus the other mainstream options that will likely come in most useful. That's because this Timex Marlin Jet has a space age crystal that encompasses the entirety of the bezel, resulting in somewhat of a sci-fi moon base appearance that I've, again, never seen on a watch before. If you'd have described this to me beforehand without me seeing it, I would have guessed this was Invicta's latest vomit inducing monstrosity. But now I've laid my eyes on it, I'm a convert. I mean, this blanket style crystal would likely only suit very specific models like this, though I found myself enamored by its rule breaking execution. While at some angles, it does remind me of a dive watch with the bezel removed, at others, it makes me wonder why nobody has tried this before, to any major degree of success at least. While Sapphire would prevent scratches to a far greater degree, given the exposed nature of this crystal, impacts are far likely to happen, and thus plexiglass seems like a logical choice. This may be the first major release with this design, but I'd guess it won't be the last. The closest I've found online is a certain tag model, though the dome there is much lower, and it's not really got a covered bezel, it's more like a raised chapter ring from the looks of it. Let me know if you've seen anything similar in the comments. Here the bezel still holds the dial in place, but takes on a role as a location for additional branding or design composition. A pair of laser engraved written Marlin logos sits at 12 and 6, while the remaining distance is spanned by two slim lines, giving the illusion of a multi-tiered design from above. 
In future, I think this implementation could be an interesting way of identifying a model or make name without having to plaster text all across the dial. Timex hasn't gone down that route. They've instead retained them all in wording on the dial too, which I think is a slight error of judgment. I think we know by now it's part of the Marlin range. Regardless, the rest of the dial helps solidify its place as a very pretty sub $500 watch. It mirrors some style cues from the Midtown dress watch, including a comparable upwardly curved chapter ring combined with inset hour markers for extra depth. The Marlin Jet also has a similarly slim handset, but with a different second hand that contributes towards the light aviation theme. The dial surface itself isn't quite so special. It's an inoffensive satin silver grey, which keeps the watch looking minimalist, though it doesn't exude class the same way as some Seiko Brassage watches do. Perhaps the most divisive inclusion here is the 24 hour subdial, which is purely there for visual interest. If this watch had a date indicator, this would be more useful, as you could quickly assess whether the watch was set to AM or PM, aiding quick alterations. As this watch has no visible date wheel to set, its practical purpose is limited, and it really depends on your aesthetic taste at the end of the day. Personally, I think it helps further differentiate this watch visually from many other Bauhaus watch designs that we've looked at, especially the Galley, which has some shared design traits, though I appreciate if you deem this to be needless clutter. I quite like it. Also contributing to the presentation, of course, is the steel case. For the most part, outside of the experimental bezel, it's a much more standard fare, with a simple brushed finish across the majority of the surface, only subverted by the polished underbelly. The rear is home to a substantial looking screw back, securing the watch to 50 meters of water resistance, as well as lasered lines running the circumference, matching those on the bezel. Through the window there, you can see the Marlin Jet is powered by a Miyota 8000 series movement. This is a super popular budget automatic that usually has some glaring drawbacks, which I have noted in previous videos. In short, while it has useful features like hacking and hand winding, it's also prone to hand stuttering issues in certain units, and usually has a horribly loud rotor across the board. Somehow, Timex has booked the trend, as their cut down custom rotor is, without a doubt, the least noisy I've come across for this caliber. It's not perfectly silent, and maybe there's some other factor in play, but either way, it's pleasing to see a reduction in this audible annoyance. Let's be real, a brand as large as Timex could have squeezed in a better and potentially slimmer movement here, which would have been my preferred choice for reasons I'll mention in a moment. This unit also has a ghost position, so adjustments made with the crown pulled out at a single click will operate the obsolete date wheel that sits beneath the dial. The degradé has fair low light performance, while the Marlin Jet has no loom whatsoever. Even considering all the shortcomings, I don't regret my purchase one bit. I bought this because I thought it looked unique and attractive, and in person, it very much still does. It fits me pretty well too. It wears similarly to the Degradé with a 38mm case size, a 43mm lug to lug distance, and a 13.6mm thickness with that domed crystal. Though this model isn't quite as well contoured to the wrist. The case thickness from the base of the crystal downwards is only 8.5mm, and while it doesn't look as thick as the online images suggest, the overall Overly slim sides still leave a slight bulbosity when the watch is on wrist, despite the steeply curving lugs. It's not nearly as bad as the hump on the Seiko SNXS for example, but when combined with a pass-through strap, the Marlin Jet remains a touch taller than most other compact watches. If Timex had splurged for a thinner Miyota 9000 series movement, or switched to a hand-wound alternative, they could have created something even sleeker. But that's all shoulda, woulda, coulda, isn't it? What conclusions can we draw from the watches that they actually released? Well, I think it's obvious that Timex has started to put design and visuals front and center. They haven't totally dismissed other factors like build quality or features. The more expensive watches, they generally have improved build quality and specs over the cheaper models, but those things have taken slightly more of a back seat. So they're now falling short of some other brands in terms of finishing or materials, especially at these elevated prices. But you know what? I'm not sure that's such a bad thing. Most watches are primarily vessels for self-expression and fun, wrist-mounted art, if you will. These newer Timex models cater better to that use case than those of yesteryear. Both the Jet and Degradé are distinctive, character-packed, stylish timepieces that don't look boring, cheap, or generic. While far from class-leading at their respective prices, the build quality is still serviceable for most people and better than most garbage fashion watches. And you see, that's the crux of the matter, really. Timex 
I don't think they're really trying to outdo those spec monster Chinese brand watches. That'll always be a losing battle. You'll always find someone who can list X number of specs for less money. Something much harder to beat or undercut is fresh, interesting, tasteful design work. That's really what Timex has invested in over the last few years. And I think it's why they're thriving now. From the Q Timexes to the Marlin range and the Galley lineup, they've been pumping out thought-provoking designs at a near monthly rate, which is difficult for the competitors to imitate and keep up with. Their design team seems able to make watches of almost any level look more premium, allowing them to raise prices without a major increase in complexity or build quality. People want to wear and own these cool designs, despite the humble wristwatch basically being superseded in the modern era. As long as their watches remain reasonably built, I think it's probably the right move. Would these be better value if they had nicer finishing or upgraded movements? Sure, are those factors deal breakers? I don't think so. In my eyes, these are the sort of unique, low cost watches that may actually get you compliments or act as a conversation starter. Not the nth different minimalist fashion watch or Rolex Submariner clone that everyone has seen before. With the Marlin Jet in particular, you're getting a somewhat luxury looking watch from a distance that won't get you mugged on the street. Seriously, I have absolutely no motivation to buy a luxury watch in the UK right now, as I don't fancy getting assaulted or going into debt just to own one in the first place. There are affiliate links down below if you want to check them out. The Degrade gets a 7.9 in terms of looks and a more modest value rating of 7.1. The Marlin Jet, meanwhile, gets a strong 8.4 in the looks department and a value score of 7.4. Like any Timex watch, consider signing up for their newsletter discount or waiting for a sale to bag these for a chunk less change. It's a similar story to the Seiko Presage, which you can watch my review of on screen now. That model takes this concept to an even greater extreme, so Come and find out why for yourself.